Okay, so last week we got all the way to 145, right? Yeah. Which was about how, you know, if, if there's a god, there's there are rock, there are even rocks that are associated with that god. And what I want to start with you now is this section that goes from 146 to 150. And these are propositions that are about the inner structure of divine orders. So uh, we've talked about how each unparticipated principle, noose, soul, being, life, has um, a set of gods that produces it. And this is the order of the gods that's proper um, for that principle. So for instance, the intellectual gods produce noose. And um, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between gods and primary beings, but that's because each of these unparticipated principles is actually multiple inside it, right? So noose has noose in itself and being in itself and life in itself, for instance. So you have at least three gods that um, constitute noose. And so he's going to talk about this inner structure of these orders of, uh, of, of gods, um, starting with 146. These... Um, these are going to illustrate a bit what we talked about way back in Proposition 6. Because Proposition 6 was also about these, about this, this first unified groups, that they're all composed of henads. And that means that each of them, that each of the members has to unite the whole group. And so these propositions are going to be about how, how do different gods unite a group, right? What are the different kinds of, of unity in a, in a group of gods? And so that they'll be talk about that. And this will set up later um, propositions about different kinds of gods, because we've talked about how the gods are primary in every way. So there isn't actually like a form of divinity that they all share and they have to conform to. So if there's a structure amongst gods, it's because the gods themselves are making it. And so later for each of these for each of the functions that he, of structural functions that he identifies here, he's going to identify a, a kind of God. So, for instance, in one of these propositions, he mentions that there's always a first God in each divine order. And so later he'll say there has to be a paternal, there have to be paternal gods, right? And these are the gods that are at the beginning. Um, but we'll get there, we'll get there. So this is just to talk about where this is in the discussion. Um, so why don't you read the title of 146? I'll mention some things. Okay, yes. So 146 says, okay, in any divine procession, the end is assimilated to the beginning, maintaining by its reversion, by its reversion theater to, to it, a circle without beginning and without end. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just the thing about end and beginning, it's arche and telos. So, I mean, it has both the ideas of end and beginning, but also like result and origin, right? Arche also means principle and telos, right? So, and, and he's playing with both things. And, um, just before you read this, um, uh, the um, the proposition, the proof, when Dodds write entire orders, that's not a very good translation. That's not very exact. In the Greek, we have high holi taxes, which would be the universal orders, and that's a way of talking about the orders of the gods because they're the they're the orders that produce these universal principles, like new soul and so on. Right. So when he says entire orders here, and he means orders of gods, okay. and this could be another one of those um, arguments where he says, "Oh, this is true for everything." So certainly, it's more true for, for the gods. Mm -hmm. All right. So read, read, read the text. We can talk more. Yes, I will talk more. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, so the text, the argument is for 
it's if each single processive term reverts upon its proper initial principle from which it's preceded, this is 31, or this is the basic principle of reversion that we that we learned, which I forgot what it means. And much more surely, the entire orders, or you said universal orders, like uh, kinds of things or universal things, uh, proceed from their highest point and revert again upon it. This reversion of the end upon the beginning makes the whole order one and determinate, convergent upon itself and by its convergence, revealing unity in multiplicity. Okay. Right. Um, um, so sure, a few things. So yeah, back way back when we saw this proper proposition 31, um, that is, you know, every, everything that uh, proceeds that goes forth is a symbol of its cause, right? Every effect is a symbol of its cause. And, and here he's, and, and there they, he already commented that, you know, this goes um, uh, not just to its immediate cause, but also to all the other previous causes. Right. And so also in, if you have an if you have an order, like an order of gods, you have A, B, C, D, then that then B refers to A and C refers to A and D refers to A as well. So what he's talking about is this thing that the last thing D refers to the first A. Um and and so so this is true about any series of, of terms that proceed from each other. And it's not just about gods. What what he's saying is that if it's true about anything, it's much more true about the gods because they're more united. And so if there's a form of unity amongst uh, effects and causes, it's going to be stronger there. Mm -hmm. um, now, now um, this thing, and just to give you some examples of what does this mean, of like what is an example of a reversion of the end upon the beginning? Well, Zeus, the Demiurge, gives two examples of this. Is because on the one hand, he is the last of the what Proclus calls the intellectual fathers. And mythically, he does revert to the principle of this order, which is Cronus, right? He turns towards him instead of paying attention to him, he crack he castrates him and and throws him and, and binds him. And uh, throws him down to Tartarus. And so um, that's one thing that's, I mean, mythically, how would you say this makes the order one indeterminate? Well, this is how, you know, Zeus concentrates all the power in himself myth uh, mythically. And he becomes king. Um, and he becomes the center and convert and makes everything converge upon himself and so on. Um, and Okay, and according to this, that means that he unites with his father. Like, yeah. While in the myth, it's him, like, ruining him. It's like the opposite. Yeah, so it's this uh, it's this thing of, like, when, you, when the myths describe something negative happening amongst the gods, you only focus on the positive. Right, so also, like, the, 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 the myth of stealing of fire. So from, uh, from, uh, from, from Zeus by Prometheus. Prophet says what we have to pay attention to is just the fact that if it's a theft, it's something that, it hap that happens without his will. So it's something that's beyond his will, it's something that he gives by nature and not by choice. Right. Um, so this is typical Brocklean interpretation. And also, um, uh, Zeus um, also he's he not only has a relationship with the with Cronus he also has a, a relationship with the animal itself right the paradigm of the world as the demiurge has a relationship with the paradigm of the world in the Timaeus and mythically this is there's this Orphic myth and so that about this god Phanis which they identify with Eros which Proclus says is the living bee itself. And then there's this myth about how Zeus swallows Phanis, right? And so that's, again, how he brings this whole, and the 
the living being itself is the first appearance is the, it's the it's where the primary forms exist and so by doing but by, by swallowing him you know he 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 closes the development of all the kinds of uh, all the kinds of forms right those are the primary forms and then in Zeus you have the most um distinguished forms in him um, so these are mythical examples of uh, of an of the end of an order going back to its beginning and making the order one and determinate. In the case of, of Zeus reverting to Kronos, it's the order of intellects. Of Zeus going back to Phanes, following Phanes, that's the order of of forms of different kinds of forms. Um, so. So that's um, so those so those are just some some examples. Uh, the um, do you, I don't know. Do you have more questions? We can we can talk. Yeah. About um. That. So I, I one thing that I'm gonna um. Firstly, what are the I'm I'm a little confused about all of these gods now. What is the so we have gods as the henads, like this group of things before or above everything, or like between the one and the first like noose or or between the one and being or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um and those are separated into all these orders. So like there's henad mm -hmm. for intellectual, the intellectual henads and soul henads and body henads and so on. Mm -hmm. And then those orders within the henads are, are they also going to be in the world, like in the news or their relation, they're going to then have a relation like to the... To the like one, one noose, and then through that to the rest. That's how it works. Um. Yeah. So, like the each of these orders will constitute um one universal principle. So, like all the intellectual gods, they constitute noose, and through like noose itself, and then through noose all. All the individual noes, all the many nooses. Is that the question? Yeah, I think. Um, and then, yeah. um, so something like, uh, no, but, but so, but it only they're only like intellectual gods and psychical gods and so on, in the sense of. Like being the source of the source of your soul, at least right. twice like that, and there are different ways yeah. of connecting, like we discussed, like the vertical and horizontal and crossing ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so something like in the in the Kabbalistic pictures, you would say, okay, there are there are let's say three worlds or four worlds, whatever. I don't know. Um. But people say things like there are um mm, what they call it. Well, they don't really use these words, these terms, but let's say we have minds and feelings and actions, something like that. And which somehow correspond to these three things, but not really. Or maybe yeah, I don't know. And then they would say, okay, so in the Sefirot himself, we have Chabad Chagat Nahi or something like that, which somehow correspond to they're not minds, but they correspond or are the source of those minds and created worlds, so to speak. Hmm. So yeah, so 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 there's a there's an analogy here because there are these first things that each of them is a unity and they're all united with each other in some way. These are like such a road. And then some of these are responsible for one world, some of these are responsible for the next world, some of these are responsible for the last world. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. that it works like that. And there's within these, uh, with each of these groups, there's uh, there's structure, there's unity. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, okay. Yeah, I remember that I'm not being happy with that because everything has to be responsible for everything. So maybe, I don't know. Um, now, the unity that we're looking for here is within the divine order, right? So you want like all, forget about the unity of the whole world or of the uh, things that have minds with the mind itself. That's a different discussion. Like what he right. says here is about the unity of like different levels of gods that are responsible for different levels of mind or something like that, of nous, I say in mind. Right. Um, it's, not, it's about the unity of the different gods that are responsible for nous. So there's one uh, there is one god that's responsible for the being in nous. There's another god that's responsible for the life in nous. And there's another God that's responsible for what's specific to news and how, uh, what's the unity of these three? Yeah, that's that's the question. What's the what's the relationship between them? Okay. Yeah. And and the answer has to do all right. The answer here, or maybe there's other things. Um, the principle he's using here is this point of reversion. Yeah. Um. Which says like since, um, how does it go? Like since the life is is a term that proceeds from the being or something like that, if I remember correctly. So it yeah. also returns to the being. Yeah. And so uh, does the noose return to the being and to the life and to and whatever to the life and to the being. Yeah. And that's why it is one with it. Right. And this reversion must be better than the reversions that we have, like where I revert to noose, for example, yeah. the general or this particular one, because when I do that, I don't actually become as one with him as the god becomes one with the other god. Right. Here he doesn't really specify why it's better. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, there's also like, um, we can say, well, it must, there must be some kind of higher unity because they produce this unified thing, which is universal news. Um, whereas, you know, a person becoming wise doesn't produce something like that. It's not this kind of unity. Um, but he doesn't really specify here. He just says, because they're gods and a god, uh, you know, they're henads, and a henad is by nature a unity. The unity must be stronger, but it doesn't really specify mm -hmm. it. That's something we'd have to okay. investigate more. Does he ever give like a plain definition of like what you what's the unity that the gods have more than the other things? He does. I mean, plain. I don't know if you'd call it plain, okay. but. <laughs> Uh, but in the Parmenides commentary, he said, hey, for instance, there's a passage where he contrasts the henads with the forms. And he says that the forms are related to each other by sameness and difference. Whereas the henads, they are related to each other by union and a peculiar characteristic, um, um, unique property. And the the difference here, at least with regard to the forms, seems to be something like there isn't a common nature that's specified, which is the case of the forms, right? Genre and, and species. You know, yeah, it's common background, but rather each of them is this un has this unique uh, character, this unique individual, and at the same time they are all in all. Um, they they all include each other. So we've talked about that with, you know, it seems also to be, when he talks about pri about infinity, primary infinity, he seems to be talking about that as the first being in another. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, he, he does talk about it, but it's, it's hard to cash out. Okay, you want to say they're all in all? Fine, um, but then why aren't they many? Um, you know, why, why why do they still stay simple? It's um, it's unclear. I mean, you can say things like, 
well, each of them is, you know, is an absolute unity by, by itself and as an absolute unity, they're all identical, weird. But if people want to say that, there's um, one thing, you know, they're, they only distinguish themselves insofar as they proceed from unity itself, from the one. And, but then so far as they remain in it, they remain, um, you know, they, they are somehow united. Um, it's so like what they have in common is unity itself and unity itself is not the, uh, some kind of common nature, right? It's just unity. Um, it's not even a whole of parts. It's something more basic than that. Um, you know, when, when Brockles gets close to unity itself, and whenever he talks about the unity of the gods with each other, he starts to get very apophatic and things. And so he doesn't really have a good account of this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I understand the, the like the the problem being something like that our um language of one and many is generally the language of forms where like all the beautiful flowers have one form of beauty which is in them in three different ways or whatever um and then since he wants this thing beyond forms which is not simple unity still uh it's like yeah because he wants this like individuality somehow um uh, it becomes something like we don't really know how to speak about uh unity which is not like really based in this form concept it has to be it has to be in some sense yeah we end up saying these funny things like which make it sound in some some way more diverse. Like each one is independently everything he is, um, but also everything else, and not contingent on everything else by himself. Everything else, something like that. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, one one way I've thought about this is something like I don't know the the vertices of a polygon, right? Each of them is is unique because it bounds these these lines these these sides but if you take the points themselves all your points is like every other um and so the points in this would be like the the gods and the the, the sides and the lines of the polygon and the volume these are the beings and point and and the point itself is is the one, um, and and you know you can say well you can draw the whole polygon starting from any point. I don't know, uh, but then of course it's uh, it's although I said you know each polygon is unique because of its position, it's not really very unique, right? You can. Uh, the mathematical image loses the uniqueness that it wants to preserve. Um, so, so yeah, it's um, difficult. Yeah. Okay, I see. And the thing we don't somehow want to do is like have the one in them being the only thing that's responsible for the unity. Yeah, because he wants to say that if, I mean, he, if, um, yeah, he doesn't want them, for instance, to be just many masks or something of the one itself. Um, because he thinks that, well, one, you know, there has to be some ground for the differences here, the differences in being up there. And if it was all confused, if this was all actually one thing, you could get the differences down here. Um, that's one of the things that he said in 135. And um, also, you know, he wants to distinguish between the particular unities, which are the henads, which are the unity of this kind of being. There are, for instance, 
of the or the intellectual gods are the unities of the nous, and he wants to distinguish other particular unities from the unity itself, the one. Um, so that's also why, you know, he wouldn't be happy talking about them as somehow like aspects of the one. Hmm. Um, it's, it's unclear. I see. Uh, um, like, uh, Um, well, to, to add something, just what you're saying, I mean, yeah, we most often think about unity and diversity in terms of forms. Broncos thinks that we can do a little bit better because he thinks that when we think about parts and wholes, we have, you know, it's something that isn't a form in many differences, you know, you can, but um, that's still not enough because a whole still has this multiplicity in it. And um, Damascus, um, so uh, the, the last head of the Potomac Academy, he also distinguishes between elements and a mixture. So that's a, something even more united than the parts of the whole, right? So if you, the, you know, you, you bake a cake and with flour and butter, and then in every part of the cake, there's both flour and butter. Mm -hmm. yeah. and so they're always mixed together um would that i but i still think that also isn't how you know uh unity and uh, and the multitude of the henads um are related to each other um it's it's un it's unclear i see yeah Okay. Um, um one one else question. Um two more two other questions. Um so one is that what you referred to the myths, do all the myths then become about like all the stories about the gods are about the or store like orders of Hanads in themselves? I mean the myths have gods acting in the world. Or we just ignore all of that? Um, so a myth can have many levels of meaning. And uh, primarily it's, you know, I mean, like the primary sense is going to be about, yeah, it's going to be about the orders of gods. Sometimes things, relationships of gods within a single order or between orders. Um, and... As for God's acting in the world, Proclus thinks, well, sometimes you have to interpret that, that it's actually a daimon of the God that's, um, um, that's meant. So it's a, you know, it's a dependent being that's, that God, that God uses as an instrument to fulfill his will. Um, in some, sometimes they talk about the gods and the world in the sense of, for instance, they're talking about how the God um, constitutes a part of the world. So when Zeus tells the other gods in the Iliad, go and take sides in the battle, for Proclus, this is a um, a um, you know this is a symbol of um, how the gods take part in creating mortal beings, because you know war is a symbol for uh, mortal existence. And um, and this is specifically about gods. Um, Proclus, for instance, for heroes, um, Proclus uses other things. So he'll so sometimes contextualize, like, like historically, saying, "Oh, that's a cultural thing. That's you know, that's why they're acting weird and things like that." And he's not committed to heroes. Um, well. I mean, he can admit some, I think he can admit some forms of vice in heroes, 
my mind is cloudy at the moment because there are other moments when he does try to protect, for instance, um, Odysseus from uh, certain accusations. Um, but but yeah, so like the standards for heroes change. They're not the same standards as of, of gods. It's gods that have to always be allegorized. Mm -hmm. Um. And um, and there can be many many levels. So he certainly thought, for instance, that um, the Trojan War really happened, and, and that you know there, there was divine intervention there. Okay. Um, um, one more question. Is that not enough for that? Um, the beginning and the end thing. So, is that just fancy words for the same thing of reversion? Uh, like. I don't think we had those words before or mm. um oh no he's talked about beginnings and ends before um and so if we go to 33 I believe um so in 33 he says all that proceeds from any principle reverts upon it it has a cyclic activity we've talked about how this meant circular actually there's it's always going around its cause, and because it's going around its cause, it's always reverted towards it, but by moving around it, it's uh, it's proceeding as well. And, uh, and here, for if it reverts upon that principle whence it proceeds, it links its end to its beginning, and the movement is one and continuous, originating from the unmoved, the unmoved again returning. Um, and... No, so I mean, there there are issues here, but um, the um so and this idea of end and beginning there and also here he's referring to a uh, an older Greek philosopher called Alcman, uh, pre-Socratic, and who said that. This is why men die, because they cannot link the beginning to the end, right? And it's very probable that he was contrasting human beings with the cyclic life of heavenly bodies. Right? So that's, and But this is like, came a, you know, a known proverb in, in Greek philosophy, and so he's making reference to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the... And, the beginning. Yes. And and also because of this idea that this in effect circles around its cause, um, that means that if you have an effect of an effect, it's going to circle around the circle of its cause. And that's similar to the um to the to explaining uh the movement of the planets with epicycles. Right? So there's an analogy here between um, the structure of the heavens and the structure and the causal structure of reality. Um, so here, when he's talking about each divine order, you know, being like a circle, well, it's a circle around what? Around the previous divine order. And, uh, and it's a center for the following one. So also amongst the gods, they're all dancing. You know, they're dancing like the planets dance. Of course, they're not dancing in space. This is just an image, but you know, there's this continuous. Okay. Now the the middle is also like the end is what's the end? Um is the middle also I don't know if there's a middle. The yeah, middle yeah, is so also like, in the beginning, just even more than the yeah. end. So we'll, in, in 148, we'll also talk about the middle more. But uh, yeah, so like in, in, the, in the intellectual gods. Um, so there's Kronos as responsible for being, and there's Rhea, his, um, his wife, um, that's responsible for life, and Zeus that's responsible for its proper to news. And, and so there is this also this middle that's responsible for also uniting the beginning and the end. Mm hmm and it just has the same thing like the same the same cause and effect or coming and going back or circling 
yeah yeah um, is there anything special about the end or that's just like even the end um i think it's yeah even the end is probably something like that maybe the the contrast with causal chains down here is something like maybe at the end of a causal chain here the power has been so degenerated that the end is no longer anything like the beginning it's a, a game of telephone but up there because they're gods then there's all there's no loss and there's almost no loss and so because mm -hmm. of that the end is really truly assimilated to the beginning that might be the contrast in that case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's um, now go to 147. Uh, when he says divine rank here, I don't know what was in Dodd's mind when he wrote rank. Um, he's translating diacosmon, so it's this, um, it's actually like divine world. Right, he's using this word, this word diaco, um, dia, diacosmos, which is um, like cosmos, like world. And I think he uses the word diacosmos so that he doesn't use um, world because he wants to maintain the platonic thing that there's only one world. But he uses this to, to say, you know, the divine orders, they are something like worlds unto themselves. They have some world-like structure. So when he says in any divine rank, he means in any divine world. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in any divine so, rank, yeah, shall I? Yeah. Yeah, in any divine rank, the highest term is assimilate, assimilated to the last term of the superadjacent rank, meaning the one above it, right? Exactly. exactly. Okay. So that's like another another meaning of the uh, beginning and the end, like the end is the beginning. Something like that. Right, right. Beginning so of B is that. the end of A. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can. Uh, but what does that mean? Know. For should I read it? For yeah. If there must be continuity in the divine procession, and each order must be bound together by the appropriate mean terms, as in one thirty-two. Remember, the highest term of the secondary rank are of necessity conjoined with the limiting terms of the primal, like the previous one. Now conjunction is affected through likeness. Therefore there will be likeness between the initial principles of the lower order and the last members of the higher. Right. So so again he, he mentioned here 132 and 132 is basically the same thing without mentioning gods. Or no I'm sorry 132 is the wrong reference. 132 is about the something within the divine orders again. No, the right reference here is 112. 112 says the first members of any or, of any order have the form of their priors. And so that is the, you know, um, uh, that applies to all beings. So the first noes are divine. The first souls are noetic. No, intellectual. The mm -hmm. first bodies are alive, right? And and here he's saying, well, the first uh, the first aspects of any universal order, the first the, the highest aspect of noose, the highest as uh, is going to be something like the lowest aspect of being. The highest aspect of soul is going to be the low, like the lowest um, aspect of noose. And and so that's what he is. Um, saying here he's again applying something that's true in general for specifically to um, uh, to the gods and it's basically the same argument that there must be um, a continuity and continuity is through likeness and this comes from you know just the thing that uh, causes are always like their effects. The the cause effect relationship is actually like is actually a relationship between an original and its copy. So, um, so yeah, there's 
there's a slight to change here, of course. I mean, there's something different to say, you know, that the first new, the first noes are divine, and to say the highest aspect of nous is, um, is like being, but there's, you know, it's an, it's an analogous structure. Okay, because the change you mean because it's the like a part of something just because yeah, exactly. of unity going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're talking about like within the if the <clears throat> if that proposition was about the relationships between orders, this is about relationships between the principles of the orders. Yeah. But so what, one thing I don't understand is how the mean there is not really a mean term then. Oh, like there's um, only two where like the first and the last are similar. There's nothing in between the first yeah, of the higher. Yeah, yeah. So so it's uh, this is also a translation thing. It would be better to say um, the orders must be bound together by appropriate meaning terms. And uh, and there it's the or one and the meaning terms between order A and order B are the last member of order A and the top member of order B. Right there, the that's that's the idea. Okay, but there so but we don't like need like the middle like there isn't really a like a like Dodd's law no, of terms like there's, there's always something there's, in between two things. No, no, there's um, th there's not something that's outside of both orders and is between them. No, yeah, just something connecting the two orders. Really, that's the more yeah. more, and they're not the same, right? The last of the previous is not the same as the first. It's two different things. They're just like very close or something like that. Exactly. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what and what oh. actually cuts them apart? That's what I'm. Like, why isn't the first aspect of the, uh, I forget all the words here, uh, whichever one. Right. So let's see the higher some one. Examples then. Um, so the highest aspect of life, right? Life is the primary procession away from being is uh, is a number so it's the differentiation of being into many discrete levels of being and that's the highest aspect of life but it's number and the low and it's like the lowest aspect of being what is the lowest aspect of being it's um it's the the animal itself the paradigm of the world so it's being as containing all the paradigms of everything so what you have in common amongst the two is is multiplicity, right? So one is um, um, one has is being with, as it were, as cause of the multiplicity of all the many beings, and the other is the distinction of uh, of being into different levels. And um, but what separates them is that the the lowest level of being is still unified, right? It's still one thing. Whereas the the the, um, the first level of life is already a principle of discrimination. Um, so that's um, that's an example of lowest highest. Um, the again the highest aspect of noose is is just this thing that noose knows itself, right? Noose is actually just a being that makes itself known. Um, and it, this has to do with that, the um, idea that the um, everything that's perfect produces, right? And the last level of life is, so life is about the expansion of being, it's the principles of expansion of being. And so the last level of life is, Perfection are the perfecting gods, the ones that make sure that all everything that can be will be, right? And so this is like a structural feature of being. So there are going to be gods that were responsible for it, and and so the difference here is between causes of perfection and and a perfect thing. So you see that there's continuity, but also separation, also distinction. Um, 
I um, I can't give you a general formula for these uh, transitions, but mm. but it um, does seem like the regular mean term where there's like three things turns out, and we have like the middle, which is in one way like this and another way like that. Right. We, we, only if you yeah. look at both together, right? Trinity. Yeah, that um, there will be a middle term that will establish the likeness or um, what's similar between the two, but um, it won't exist independently from the two of them. Right. Why not? No. <laughs> uh, why not? Where's that going? Because in a sense, um, to use the Aristotelian categories, it's in potency in one and it's actualized in the other. So you don't actually need a third. It doesn't need to exist separately. <coughs> so number actualizes the multiplicity that's within the animal itself. Um, um, the, um, uh, the perfection of noose, right? The being of noose is the actuality of the perfection that, um, that the um, uh, last the um, vital gods produce, right? Um, that's um, that's that's uh, a quick, I mean, then you want to say, but no, you can't have power and actuality there because power implies some kind of, of deficiency, something that could be and isn't. They say, no, it's not that there's no, um, it's not that kind of power, it's perfect power, it's productive power. Right. And and so so and so it's like original and copy. OK, so that means that what's um, what's common between the two, if you're going to find something that's independently that it's going to be the prior thing. So in a sense, the um, uh, the animal itself is multiplicity itself. In a way, there are problems with that. We don't, I mean, we we want to qualify that. We've seen that pure multiple. And it's last is. aspect. Yeah, uh, it, it's the last aspect of being, and it's and it's the multiplicity of being. And the and the first aspect of life is is the discrete multiplicity of being, right? So the uh, um the similar thing is in the prior thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, trying um, to. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for dragging that out of me. Um try okay. To, okay. Um okay. And that is so the let's... unity between orders, right? So we have before the unity within a order, because yeah. everything mirrors, so to speak, or symbolizes, or uh, ref I don't know how you say it. Uh, the previous thing, and then in between orders, it's the connection is the last thing always um, being very similar, or like being the source of the first thing of the last of the next thing. Yeah. And now in one hundred forty eight, we're going to go back to the internal uh, unity of each order. Mm -hmm. Okay, one hundred forty eight. What time is it? Yeah, one hundred forty eight says every divine order so a new kind new thing has an internal unity has an internal unity of threefold origin from its highest its mean and its last term right um so so this is i mean we've already talked about how the last term contributes and he's going to draw that proposition but now we're also going to talk about the highest and the the mean term. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to? Uh, you can start uh, uh, reading. Just read till that mention of Proposition One Twenty Five. Mm, okay. For the highest term having the most unitary potency of the three. Communicate its unity to the entire order and unifies the whole from above while remaining independent of it. Proposition 125. Right. Um, I'm not sure Proposition 125 is, is really um, relevant here, but um, 
So this is in general, it's like the highest term is um, is as it were the monad of this order, right? And it's it it it, it uh, determines the um, the um, the unique characteristic that all that everything in the order has. So that's one way of being um, of giving unity to it. Um, the the next is that of the no, so that's like um, so the the first um, uh, the first god of Nous, Kronos. He defines really what it is to be a Nous, um, and that's not unconnected with the fact that he is the being of Nous, right? He is the being of Nous, and the same thing for the first um, the first god of life, Number or you want the, the mythological identification, night. And so that's the um, nukes. Uh, so these are the things that give, you know, that define uh, the, the, the basic quality of everything in there. Um, the, uh, so that's one way of uniting the whole order. Now we go on to the second one, which is what the mean term does. Okay, so the um, here. Secondly, the mean term reaching out towards both the extremes links the whole together with itself as a mediator. Interesting. It transmits the bestowals of the first members of its order, draws towards the potentialities of the last, draws upward somewhere, towards upward the potentialities of the last. I don't know what that means, and implants in all a common character and a mutual nexus. For in this sense, also the giver and receivers constitute a single complete order in that they converge upon the main term as on a center. Right. So this is be giving unity as a center. Um, so um, uh, right here, just most basic thing he's talking about is that you know, A causes B causes C. So B is mediating between A and C. It's if if there weren't if there wasn't B, there would A and C would be too unlike for A to cause C, right? And and both A and C are related to it through certain similarities. Um and the transmits the bestowals of the first members of its order. Right, so it's caused by them, and it and it uh, gives that further, and it draws upward the potentialities of the last. Well, we saw this drawing upward is actually is another word for turning for epistrophe, and so the idea is that um, you know just as the first can't cause the last immediately, the last can't um, revert to the first immediately. It has to revert first to the middle thing and then through the middle thing to the top thing. So it's a uh, transmitting bestowal is procession and drawing upward is um, is reversion, right? Mm -hmm. And and because there's then this, uh, this succession, there's then also this common character and mutual nexus, nexus in this bond, this common bond. Uh, uh, things are connected to each other. Um, and that's the way that a center um, unites. It's different from the way that the um, that the top, um, uh, that the peak unites, right? The peak unites simply by defining what's common to everyone. Whereas the center, so we talked earlier um, at one point about so sometimes he calls these orders orders and sometimes he calls them chains or, or series and these are words for the same thing but they point out different things when you use order you're looking more at the whole thing as a group and and what's common right between all of them they're intellectual gods they all have that in common they all produce news whereas if you think about it as a series you're thinking more about the relations between the individual members and so we can say, for instance, that the, the peak, the highest term, produces unity as an order, and the middle term it, it produces it as a chain. Right? Those mm -hmm. are 
different kinds of uh, of unity. That's but nice. then there's the there's the third uh, thing, which is then of the end. So it's like the yeah okay. The middle also has like these middle and the beginning of the middle, right? Like transmits yeah. and reverts and is in the middle. <laughs> Something like right. I mean, depending how big the middle is, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thirdly, the limiting term produces a likeness and convergence in the whole order by reverting again upon its initial principle and carrying back to it the potencies which have emerged from it. That's what we just did in 146. Yeah. Uh, but the, everything is a limiting term if you look at it that. I mean, like the last, the middle is the sec, the first is the last for everything before it. And this, I mean, this is just like a word, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, no, you understand my question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, I understand the, um, the question. It's like, where are there really breaks? I mean, why can't you just see everything is just continuous? Why are you breaking these orders up? Um, and the, I think in one sense, Proclus wants to, would be saying, yeah, from one perspective, procession is continuous. And that's, that's fine. Um, but I don't know. I think that it's, part of, of the perfection of beings and the perfection of these universal principles that they are definite. And if they are definite, then they are some things and they are not other things. And that's why you have the end of one order and the beginning of another. Um, mm. So, I don't know, the being is characterized by remaining in, by remaining and life is characterized by procession and noose by reversion and um so once you ex so there's for instance between the last principle of remaining and so that you know that the cause remaining in itself has uh, the causal powers has all of its effects within itself as um, as a cause in an originary fashion to use the 65's um, vocabulary. So that's the last thing of remaining, but and there's a continuity with the first principle of procession, which is division, which is distinction, number. But that doesn't mean that there isn't here a um, a difference between the two. Um, so put it on the way. If the first element of an order truly produces um, some new and distinguished and determinate nature, then the other members of that order can, there will be other members of that order to articulate it and specify it. But because there is this first member that produces it, then they can't go on forever, right? That will, there will, there will be a natural term. Um, I, This follows, I guess, ultimately from the uniqueness of the gods. You know, if, if it was purely continuous, if it was like the, um, if it was like the color wheel, um, where you can't point where any color stops and the next begins, then you would, or better than a color wheel, just like a degradé uh, from like, a color like a blue to white, um, then the 
then you would lose something of the um, of the uniqueness of the gods. They wouldn't each have their own proper um, character. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, Proclus would admit that, that he would want to like limit what you just said. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. So, like, there's, there's, there's a, everything is a spectrum, but there's some kind of guy that puts things into different classes for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then like to 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 get why you have to go through the arguments about the specific classes. Mm -hmm. And um, just one thing. Well, I mean, there's the. Uh, there's still a conclusion to read, but just something about this proposition, which I think is interesting. So this proposition like di differentiates how the different henads in an order unify the whole order. Right? You can unify it as the peak, as the center, as the end. And that's um, that's important, I think, for when thinking about Proclus's philosophy in general. Uh, Edward Butler has popularized talking about Proclus's polytheism as polycentric polytheism. So he associates this with, um, you know, like uh, facts about religious practice. That if you look at actual polytheist um, uh, communities, then you know any god can be the center of worship, right? So even though the poets they present like Zeus is king, you can go in in this local place. It's Aphrodite is the main god, something like that, and and. And 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 that's all interesting, but um, it's important, like that the gods can produce a unity in ways other than being the center. It's not always that you get one god is at the center; rather, you know, there's these ways of being uh, uniting everything by being at the peak or being at the end. And so, on. so just... um, or in other ways than being on the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody so... thinks the end is so good. Yeah, so you can um, yeah. um you can wrap this up with the last thing. Thus, oh, thus, so the entire rank is one through the unifying potency of its first terms, through the connective function of the mean term, and through the reversion of the end upon the initial principle of procession. Yes, so binat tiferet malchot or chachmat tiferet malchot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, I I saw that when I studied Jekatilla too. It talks about well, there's the unity going on between Malchut and Yasod, but then you get up and then um, uh, Bina is like this other mo moment of unity of the top three with the others, and yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. So one forty nine is uh, is a bit so. Uh, it changed a little bit the subject because he says it's a just saying that there's only a finite amount of gods. And um, gods and, uh, and Proclus's view is that there's a finite amount, there are an infinite number of gods, but also that we can't know what the number is. Right? Um, but we can't know what the number is, is isn't, this isn't said here, but he says it in the Timaeus commentary. And his teacher Syriana says it in his metaphysics commentary. Um, and why does he need to prove this? He needs to prove this because if you read the Parmenides, which is where he's, you know, which he thinks is Plato's the, um, the, um, scientific theology, um, there there are arguments for why the one would need to have infinite an infinite amount of parts, and there would be infinite amount of ones. And so showing that there's actually going to be a finite amount of penads is a reason to say, well, yes, that's what the text says, but it can't possibly really mean that you have to interpret this infinity as an infinity of power and things. Mm. So there's, there's like a, an exegetical reason for proving this here. Okay. Uh, should I read it? Um, yeah. Okay. The entire manifold of divine henets is finite in number. Okay. For if it stands nearest, we oh, you said it, we don't know how many. 
you seem to be able to add them up according to all the or there's some more that we don't know about yeah there, there could be more that we don't know about yeah okay um for if it sounds nearest to the one cannot be infinite since the infinite is not cognate with the one but alien from it okay because infinite is is means entirely ununified right yeah that's what this is that. the bad meaning of infinite yeah because they don't have any coherence for if the manifold has such already a departure from the one it is plain that an infinite manifold, right? Even there being two things is already not one, but there being yeah. infinite amount of things, it's plain that an intimate manifold isn't completely bereft of its influence. And for this reason, bereft also of potency and activity, because the one is the source of potency and activity. Yes. I guess. So yeah, that's like basic math. Like if one is one and two is less one than one, then infinity is the most not one it basically doesn't exist or almost doesn't exist oh, um, exists only in you know exists only in the succession of time and in time actually only the present really exists and or if you want in the ability of matter to take in a, a, any form mm -hmm. yeah. okay um the manifold of gods is therefore not infinite, but marked by unity and limit. And this is in a higher degree than any other, since of all, what does it mean this is in a higher degree than any other? It has the most limit. Yeah, unity and limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it should be only one of them. This is weird. There should be only one. Oh, there can't be only one. <laughs> this is since of all manifold that the nearest akin to the one. So why isn't there only one of them? Why, so why is there only one of them? Um, well, we know that there has to be um, there has to be an order of gods for each order of being, mm. right? So each universal principle, the cosmos, soul, knows life, being needs its own order of gods. It doesn't even need just one god for each of these because they have inner complexity. So you have multiple gods for each of these things. So that gives us, like, philosophy can give us, give us a minimal amount of gods that's needed, but it can't tell us all the gods that exist. Yeah, we only need three or nine. <laughs> so, yeah, you can say that we only need this amount, but I think one of the reasons why you can't know the number is also, for instance, each star is a god. And can you count the stars? Um, um, that's, that's one reason. But even below, there, there are gods that are responsible for the world generation. And, and so there, I think that there are probably more of these gods than there are gods in the sky. Um, and and so that's uh so there are, are because as you go down things get more complex you don't know anymore the exact numbers of things i think already at the level of soul he says well there are 12 of gods but this number 12 is actually just a symbol for a number that we don't know um and so that's the hmm. um so, so so that's why there's a, a minimum and that's why it's not just one thing after, immediately after the one yeah. okay um the were the first principle a manifold then each would be more um manifold in a proportion as it stood near to that principle, likeness being proportionate to nearness. That's like going back to proposition one, like if there would be something like that. Um, yeah. But since the primal is one, a manifold which is conjoined with it will be less manifold than one more remote. And the infinite, far from being less manifold, is the extreme manifold, right? 
Uh, so there has to be a finite. A bit of yeah, a bit of repetition though. Yeah. Um, and and so that's why there's a finite amount of gods. And um, in 150, we talk about the the relations of superiority and inferiority between um, between the gods in 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 a divine order. And again, it seems a pretty general proposition, but that he's, he, I mean, I think you could say a lot about this also about noose, for instance, but he's saying it specifically for the gods. Um, uh, so, and the, you see the, the, the proposition, the proof has two paragraphs. These are two different arguments for the, um, um, for the proposition. Um, so why don't you read the title and then we'll talk more. Yeah, okay. Any and 150, any processive term in the divine order orders is incapable of receiving all the potencies of its producer. Okay. As our secondary principle in general of receiving all the potencies of their priors. This is basically the transcendence of the prior to the posterior always. There's always left power left over. Yeah. Um the prior principles possess certain powers, always has, which transcend their inferiors and are incomprehensible. I don't know where comprehension comes in there. To sub subsequent grades of deity. So incomprehensible in, in this means what? Not not an intellectual sense. Um, like that the, they cannot be contained within the subsequent grades. Mm -hmm. Um, right, the opposite so, is right. true, like in the in the power sense, right? They begin the previous ones are going to include the later ones, but not the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it's this idea that causes always have more than their effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Four. Mm -hmm. If the gods differ in their distinctive properties, the characters of the law, meaning. The higher and the lowers have different properties. The characters of the lower pre-subsist in the higher. Wait, the, the characters, the characters here are the um, are the distinctive properties. It's these um, so the, this is an issue. So I'll read and then I'll explain. For, for the gods, different or distinctive properties. It's these idiotes. It's these um, unique properties. Um, of each of them, the characters of the lower of the lower gods presubsist in the higher gods, whereas those of the higher gods, uh, the higher and more universal gods, are not found in the lower. The superior deities implant their products some of their own characters, but others they pre-embrace as transcendent attributes. So, the question here is that it seems to say that the superior deities have a lot of characters, a lot of unique uh, properties, and that they only share some of these with the inferior ones. Um, but if these are two, like the unique characters of each god, each should only have one. Um, and it's probably that there's, um, there's, you know, you can talk about these unique characters in two ways. You can talk about them as many attributes. So Apollo in the Cratylus is said to be a god of archery and prophecy. And he's, uh, and of healing. And a fourth thing that escapes me. And so in this sense, you know, these are individual things that he's responsible for. And there are many others. Prophet when he talks about this passage, says, well, he only mentions four, but each uh, each god has many. Um, but, of course, these are all contained, these and whatever others he has, are all contained within Apollonianness, within what is Apollonian. And, and so when he says that the, the superior characters implant their products, some of their own characters, it must mean a part of Right, so they have this unified character. The um, the lower god also has a unified character, and 
and one is a part of the other. That must uh, be what it means. Um, and so, right, yeah, okay. Uh, so again, a part of like... So, for instance, in some, according to some myths, Apollo is the father of the muses. And so the muses, they have some of, a, of, of Apollo's um, characteristics. So they have something to do with, with inspiration, um, but they don't have anything to do with archery, right? So, um, so there's, um, so some of Apollo's characteristics get handed down to the muses, but not all of them. And this is actually a principle about like reading the theogony, um, reading Hesiod's theogony and reading um, genealogies of gods in general. What is expressed by saying so-and-so was the father of these 50 gods? Well, each of these 50 gods represents some power or powers that are in, the, in their parent. So one way of describing the powers of the god is to list all their children. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like, but it do doesn't mean that each, so, but, but is that necessarily so? Like, no god, no secondary god will inherit all the powers? These seem like very discrete things. Like, sh you should be able to give it all of them if you really want. Uh, yeah, so, um, you should be able to give all of them if you really want. Um, no, you you can't give all of them. Um, I mean, in a sense, giving all of them is just so. Remember that the the hen ant produce when we're talking about hen ants producing each other, we actually mean hen ants producing beings and the beings produce each other. The way that when we talk about people producing each other, we mean souls give life to bodies that produce each other. And each of these primary beings that attaches themselves to the gods is, as it's the principle for some new kind of thing, it is self-constituted. And the giving entirely of oneself is self-constitution. It's reproducing yourself. It's producing yourself. And so it's not going to be a distinct um, henad. If a henad gave everything of itself to another uh, god, there wouldn't be anything to distinguish the two. It wouldn't be a different god. Um, the total self-gift, to use the Christian language, that that's what they like to say. You know, The father gives everything to the son, and that's why they're one. Um, that um, that wouldn't um, happen between two gods and um, against the Christians, the Christians say they are one essence because of that, and the, but they are two existences, they're two hypostases. Um, but Proctor will say, no, no, different gods have to have different um, essences, unique essences that they produce. So if the, um, the, the total self-gift of the father can only be the, the father's production of, of, the, of his own being. Um, if, I mean, yes. Uh, do you have quite, I mean, I'm sure that's not entirely clear. Hmm. Yeah, something like uh, that. I, like, I don't see. Not sure why it has to. Like, I don't know. Like, okay, I could have want... a bunch of talents and have a bunch of children or students, each of which can only get one or some of them. Um. Okay, but then there would be a differentiation because of like the body or whatever. But. But I can yeah. best have someone one that has all of them. Right. Um, but there would be the differentiation because of the body. Um why don't we stop here?